a difference. Uh, does that when we have that music? Yep. And it really speaks to our heart. Amen. Um, I want to talk a little bit tonight about our words. Uh, we've been going through the book of James on Sunday nights, and, and one of the topics that he will address more than once, in fact, we've already passed one verse that dealt with this topic, is our words. And uh, I'll be looking at uh, James chapter 3 tonight. You know, words are slippery things. I uh, discovered that very early on in life, in the second grade, they uh, used to like to play a game called telephone. Get all the children uh, in a circle, and uh, someone would whisper a phrase in the ear of somebody at this end of the circle who would pass it around to each person in the circle until you went all the way around and you came back to the person at the end of the circle who would then say something that bore absolutely no resemblance to the phrase that you started with. And it's a, a reminder that words just kind of get slippery sometimes. Uh, sometimes we have those honest miscommunication events, you know. Uh, what you heard is not what I said. And other kinds of miscommunication. Teasing and jokes that are sometimes uh, taken the wrong way because I have discovered humor is a double-edged sword. Uh, we enjoy humor. It makes us feel good when we laugh. Laughter is good medicine, the Bible says. <laughs> Uh, but sometimes uh, it's a way of getting into trouble. In fact, our words get us into trouble a lot. Even when we have the best of intentions. Let alone when we don't have good intentions. James, however, says our words are very important to the Lord. The Bible says that life and death can be found in our words. Thus saith the Lord, words are not to be good and bad as followers of Christ, but only the good. And James outlines this issue and points us toward help. If you have found James chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 12, and if you're able to, please stand in honor of reading God's word tonight. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because... You know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man able to keep the, his whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouth, mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Lord, give us wisdom to see and understand your word tonight and hear from you. But also, Lord, you implore us in your word to seek you for wisdom, to live for you. And may we uh, be made wise in the words that we use. And I pray that you would create in us a new heart that would only desire words that bear praise to you. Thank you for your word tonight. 
I pray, God, that we can look at this in the right spirit and apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name and for your sake, we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. you may be seated. The Lord says that our words are important because the effect is great of the effect of our words, that is, and are to be cultivated to praise God. That's how we are to use our words. So, first of all, the Lord says our words are important. And one illustration to uh, describe this importance is found in verse 1 uh, in the teaching of the Word. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. And so this is one application of the importance of words. Not only knowing the Bible, what the Bible says, and, and how to teach it, but also a, a consistent lifestyle that goes along with those uh, pieces of information and those facts. Otherwise, uh, we'll be judged. So when we teach others, be it in a formal setting or just an informal discussion about our faith, and about the things that we know to be true and believe in what the Bible says, uh, we are to take this on soberly, to be teachers whose lifestyle is consistent with what we're teaching. After all, it was Moses who struck the rock rather than speak to it, and his anger disqualified him from receiving entry into the promised land, although we did get to see it, and I'm not going to go into more detail on him, but to understand that there is a consequence for those who are in a position of having some authority and misuse that. However, I think that the scripture in verse 1 is sometimes overstated, um, understanding that uh, we shouldn't be afraid to be a teacher, be a formal teacher if God has equipped us with that ability, or an informal teacher because we're all teaching people what it means to be a follower of Jesus, aren't we? And so our lifestyle should uh, be in keeping with what we're teaching. And as he gets into this uh, passage, um, our words are a part of our lifestyle and should be consistent and compatible. Um, the teacher's main tool is speaking. And so he, the teacher is an excellent illustration of one whose words should be uh, very carefully used. Uh, even today, with audiovisual and um, other visual means of instruction, still teaching is a lot about talking. And a vulnerable place in the life of all of those who represent the faith is misusing uh, our words. Words are slippery things, <laughs> as we said in the introduction. And all believers need to learn to control uh, the use of words. Now, after this uh, introduction to his topic in verse 1, he gets into this, and he is uh, very practical and very honest. In verse 2, uh, he mentions this. I have underlined in my Bible, we all stumble in many ways. And in this, James includes himself when he says, we all stumble. It's an honesty uh, that is refreshing. He is not speaking from some kind of an ivory tower and looking down upon other people and saying, we ought to get your act straightened up. He says, no, we all stumble in many ways. In our speech, we stumble. And the emotions and motives behind our words, we stumble. We're not free from the sin nature yet. We're not everything in Christ that we ought to be yet. We've not reached the full measure of maturity and perfection in Christ yet. And so this is an important topic to study, and I think a priority. In years past, many years ago, I determined that every year I would preach at least one time on the topic of forgiveness, forgiving other people. Not only God's forgiveness of us, but at least one time specifically. I think this may also be another topic worth an annual uh, preaching. And so you may hear this again someday. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> here he says, if you can control the tongue, 
you can keep the rest of your life in check. Sounds like that's pretty important. It's a, it's a major part of our discipleship. Control the tongue because there are consequences when we do and when we don't. The Lord says our speech is important because the effect of our words is great. As the Bible says, there's both life and death in words. Our words have something to do with controlling our entire life. Verses uh, 3 and 4, he gives a, a couple of very quick, very easy to understand illustrations about control. And then in verses 5 and 6, he talks about the effect or the destination that we reach uh, with our words. And the two examples that he gives are the, the bit or bridle that controls the direction of the animal. It might be a large animal, a very powerful animal, and yet something so small as a bit in the mouth of a horse can control the direction uh, of where that animal is going to go, and therefore the destination as well. The rudder of a ship, if you compare the, the, the uh, tonnage of a ship, all of the different parts of, of just what comprises the vessel, let alone the cargo that can be carried by that, and the people that can ride in the ship. And, and you compare that with the size and the weight and the scope of the rudder. Um, the rudder is very small in comparison. And yet without it, you're not going where you want to go. Uh, even in storms, the rudder controls the ship. So he's talking about controlling our life and uh, understanding that the words that we use affects the course of our life. We can all look back at our lives and think about if words had been different, the uh, course of our life might well have been different also. Our words have the power of life or death. James here describes destruction that can come from the sinful nature that finds expression with the tongue. In verse 5 and 6, he says the, the tongue is a fire, a world of evil. Just as a forest can be destroyed by something as simple as a spark, mighty and great tracts of land that have been laid waste by a campfire that was not properly extinguished and some sparks got out or a lightning strike that, that starts a small fire in one spot and spreads over millions of acres. So our words can wreck lives, can wreck opportunities, can wreck families, can wreck churches, can wreck our witness. A firestorm that can uh, occur through rumors and gossip and sharp and cutting remarks. Reputations that can be ruined falsely, but not by nothing more than words that are used or misused. Fights and injuries. Jobs can be lost. Reputations and relationships set ablaze by something as simple as a word and how it is used. The tongue, he says, corrupts the whole person. Now that was a little bit of a new concept to me as I thought about this. Some ideas that I realized, but just the way that it was put together here in this passage. The tongue corrupts the whole person. Think about this. How much evil is expressed through words? Evil leads to anger. Evil leads to immorality, to idolatry, to cursing and blasphemy. Malice, wickedness, divisiveness. In fact, name any sin. Do words either express the inner intentions? An example would be plotting a crime. To talk about committing a crime is actually a crime in itself. It's called conspiracy. The words themselves express malice. They express criminal intent. Uh, in the eyes of the law, well, in the eyes of humanity, and certainly in the eyes of God, they, they express the inner intentions, the inner desire, uh, name any sin. The inner intention of it can be expressed in words, and the words themselves can be a tool of evil. 
false accusations, lying and malicious gossip, things like this that destroy uh, people's reputations and rob them of opportunities. Probably all of us have been the victim of those who would take away or deny us things in life through false accusations. The Bible says where words are many, sin is not absent. Very true. After all, James says, the source of our fiery tongue is hell. Hell with all its destructive intent. Angry, ugly, cursing, unclean, divisive, suggestive, hurtful, lying, embellishments brings us into all kinds of wicked activity. And think about how many people have um, imperiled their lives or their reputations or their careers uh, through the misuse of words. Celebrities and politicians who misremember the facts. New word come into our vocabulary. Uh, Brian Williams, I believe it was. For whatever the reason, I don't know his motives or understand the situation entirely, but misremembering things that never really happened, but words that that took on, as James says, uh, that the tongue can boast about great things that in this case weren't really true or real. Others who have been debunked for claiming to be something that they weren't, these, these facts and these things that are uh, bigger than themselves that, that proved to be not true and have imperiled their lives, let alone how many families have been wrecked through words, how many churches have been wrecked through misused words, how many lives have been lost through the wrong word. The Bible confirms verse 2 when it says we stumble in many ways. Isaiah 59, 3 says, Your lips have spoken lies and your tongue mutters wicked things. Mm -hmm. Proverbs 10, 8, God said, With his mouth the godless destroys his neighbor. Not with swords, guns or bombs, but with words, with our mouth. We destroy our neighbors. But in Psalm 101, verse 5, God said, Whoever slanders his neighbor in secret, him I will put to silence. So the Lord commands us to do something about our words. In Ephesians 4, 31, he says, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. And here he's talking about the emotion and especially the motive behind the words. If we get rid of bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, and every form of malice, what are our words going to sound like? It would be very different than that of those who hold on to those things. First Peter, uh, here the apostle said much the same thing. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. So he's talking about our words, the importance of our words. Psalm 34, 13, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking lies. Hebrews 12, make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Bitter roots grow up and they, it expresses itself so often through words. Because, James says, verses 7 and 8, the tongue is a restless evil. You know, human beings have tamed all kinds of creatures. You can pet wild animals in a preserve. <laughs> you can use all different kinds of animals for farming. Uh, they have for how many centuries? You can use all types of, and tame all types of animals for uh, uh, show purposes. I uh, think SeaWorld. You, you can have all kinds of animals as pets. Uh, some of them uh, I would prefer, some of them I would actually prefer. All kinds of creatures of this uh, uh, Animals, birds, reptiles, creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed 
by man. And yet he makes a very bold assertion here in verse 8. No man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. How inconsistent we can be. Praising God on Sunday. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, brother and sister. And on Monday, cursing the same. Verse 2. We all stumble in many ways. Meets, verse 10, the second sentence. My brothers, this should not be. The Lord says our words are important because the effect of our words is great. And therefore they are to be cultivated to praise God. Blessing the Lord. It is not right that a believer's words should be untamed. And the Bible says we're to take great care in our words. And I admire those who are very disciplined in their wording and vocabulary, what they speak about. Ephesians 4.29 tells us that we are to use caution in our words, not only, uh, as I take the verse to mean, uh, in those that we speak to, but everyone who hears our word. Uh, Ephesians 4.29 says this, Do not let any unwholesome talk, and some of you uh, have translated that word to mean meaningless, do not let any unwholesome or meaningless talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And sometimes there's more people listening than just the person we're speaking to. The Lord revealed that to me one day. So you know what? You and that other person, you, you, you may be uh, cutting it up and, and, and you understand where each other's coming from, but somebody else listening doesn't. And so we ought to stop and think before we use our words, is this building up this person that I'm speaking to and anyone else that may hear this word through what is said and what is not said? Well, verse 8, he says, no man can tame the tongue. And that's true. We can't do it in our own strength. But I believe that just as Jesus can deliver the lost person from their sin, Jesus can also help us tame that tongue when we give it over to him. You know, in the beginning of James, he says, let all those, he says, if any of you, one Verse 5, lack wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and will be given to him. If that's an area of difficulty, we need to say, Lord, make me wise in words. It requires keeping watch. And it starts with the heart. Many people know Proverbs 4.23 that says, above all else, Guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. The heart's important. It's interesting, the very next verse in that chapter in Proverbs says, put away perversity from your mouth and keep corrupt talk from your lips. From the heart to the lips. It goes right there. The connection to me is so clear. Above all else, guard your heart. Yeah, it'll change what comes out of your mouth. In Psalm 34, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking lies. In James 1, 26, if any man considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. See, James has already brought up this topic of tongue and things that need to have a rein applied to them to control where it's going. Proverbs 21, 23, he who guards his mouth and keeps his tongue keeps himself from calamity. Truer words have never been heard. <laughs> How much calamity comes from a reckless word. And one of my favorite uh, passages on the topic and much uh, needed passage that I need to pray this scripture many times a day. Psalm 141, verse 3. Set a guard over my mouth, O Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Definitely an amen. Proverbs 16, 23. A wise man's heart guides his mouth. 
His lips promote instruction. And it brings us right back to what James is saying in chapter 3. Control the speech and keep on teaching. A wise man's uh, heart guides his mouth and therefore the words that come out are instructing. He is teaching and his lifestyle is in keeping with what it should be. It goes together. Because good words come from a heart that is focused on the Lord. It's a matter of the heart. We start by looking at the heart. Words are a barometer and a thermometer of the heart. Patient, kind, rejoicing in truth, bearing all things, believing God in all things, not puffed up, not jealous, not rude, not provoked, not thinking evil thoughts, mature in Christ. Those things show up in our speech. On fire for the Lord, unaffected by worldly desires. It's seen in the topics that we talk about. It shows God's glory. It blesses others. It, it lifts up Christ. It edifies the listener. It honors our church when we use edifying words. So choose those. I think it's a get real moment for our own life, our own personal growth, and also for the protection of of our church and the health of our church, that we need to take this seriously. Words matter. After all, fig trees don't produce olives. Grapevines don't produce figs. And a fountain doesn't have both fresh and salt water. It's one or the other. And our words need to be cultivated to be words that praise God, that edify the believer, and benefit all who listen. Well, if we discover that this is an area where we need to work in our lives and we need to pray, as I, I mentioned, Psalm 143, ask God to set a guard over my mouth because otherwise I'm liable to bring much calamity upon myself. How do we deal with this? We first surrender our entire self to Jesus. And our entire self includes our tongue. It's a part of the body. A small part of the body, but it's a part of the body. And we are to offer ourselves as living sacrifices to God. That means every part of it. Not holding out any. And secondly, to recognize and admit that we all stumble. Verse 2. All stumble in many ways. This isn't new. In fact, we could probably all tell a humorous story or two on ourselves, or 20 or 30. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, in spite of that, we can't use that as an excuse to say, well, everybody does it. So therefore, it's okay when I do it. No, it's, it, everybody stumbles, but it's not okay because of its dangers. That's right. And because of the Scripture's admonition. Out of our mouth ought not come cursing and blessing, but blessing only. So then we commit to change how we speak to others and what we speak about. And who, capital W, who you speak about. And ask God for wisdom to control those words. Because we have been given something very important. You know, Jesus said that every idle word that is spoken will be judged. Just like all the blessings that we've been given, the material and the physical uh, blessings that we have and the abilities that we have and how we use them for the kingdom, if God's given us the ability to speak, to utter forth words or to write and to uh, print forth words, I believe we're going to be accountable for how we use them. So it's important. And if our words are hard to control, I think we need to look deeper. What is in the heart that God wants to deal with? And ask Him to go there and reveal it. And start the change there. I invite you to join me in this prayer. It's found in Psalm 19, verse 14. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart 
be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Lord, indeed, our words are not 